Please turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. <laughs> Philippians chapter 3. That's the second time I've done that. Not too long, has it? Philippians chapter 3. We'll read uh, verses 1 through verse 16. <clears throat> Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which, wor which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh. If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But, that, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I might win Christ. And to be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Paul here begins chapter 3 with almost a concluding remark. Rejoice in the Lord. But there was a dividing line that is given in this text of where joy in the Lord began and joy of some other means ended. In verse 8 he says, I count all things but loss. That is, all things prior to this point I count as loss. For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered all things, or uh, have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, that I might win Christ. Here's the dividing line. Paul at one time in his life rejoiced, but he rejoiced in something other than Christ. And here we have a dividing line where he rejoiced now in Christ, and for a certain a purpose, as we'll point out later in this lesson. And that which he once rejoiced in, he now says, I count but dumb, or refuse, or worthless, or trash. That which is to be done away with, that which would, uh, should give no joy, right? That which uh, should be uh, thrown away, not considered anything worth having joy in. And that was his previous life, wasn't it? That was his previous life. And it is the case today that individuals 
uh, have joy in the things that they do, joy in the things that they uh, practice, joy in the things perhaps in the things that they believe and teach, or for that matter, joy in the things that they don't do or don't teach or don't practice. But there's a dividing line. And that dividing line is whether one is in Christ and what happens before that period. Any joy that comes before that period, Paul says, we ought to count it but dung. We ought to count it loss. No matter how great it is. Paul here mentions a few things that, po that pointed that he had a great life before Christ in the flesh. And of course, uh, he was uh, able to justify himself by these great things. But he begins here by saying, rejoice in the Lord. And then he summarizes what was done that was not joy in the Lord. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. The concision there being a reference to uh, individuals of the Jewish faith who had been either converted to Christianity and were trying to bring Christians back to Judaism or Jews who were trying to keep people from converting to, to Christ. They wanted people to continue in that old way of life, that uh, to continue to rejoice in a law that was nailed to the cross, Colossians 2 verse 14, been taken out of the way, and could no longer save. That was the concision. They had caused division. And he says in verse 3, we are the circumcision. That is, we were of that law. But now, we worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. The flesh being a reference to the law of Moses. The law of Moses was a, a fleshly, physical law. People had to uh, make uh, physical sacrifices and the, uh, had to make physical uh, travels and things of that nature. Everything was physical in nature. Now the sacrifices are, are spiritual in nature. Jesus made one sacrifice to atone for the sins of men for the world. There's no need for any other uh, animal sacrifice. There's no, any, there's no need for any more blood sacrifice. Those physical animal sacrifices have been done away because the law has been done away. And the spiritual sacrifices that we partake in today are not like the physical uh, sacrifices that were offered daily and yearly under the old law. So he says here that we did at one time have joy in, our, in that previous life. And as it was the case, his previous life was in a different religion, Judaism. And that could be the case today. Individuals could be in a denomination. They could be... Uh, believing something that is not true, but still rejoicing, right? Because they have not come to a knowledge of Christ. They've not come to a knowledge of, of what it means to be true to the one true church of the Bible. Or it may be the case that they're not religious at all, but they have joy in the life that they have, right? Many people today have great joy in the things that they they do and enjoy Sunday as a day off rather than as a day of worship and a day of praise that is to belong to God. And they live for themselves. They live to please self rather than they live, uh, rather than living to please God. And they joy in that. They find joy, right? But whether it be a past religion that is false, that cannot save, as it was in the case of Paul, or whether it is a past life of joy and uh, living it up in the world, as it may be the case today or with any others, Paul says, I count that joy, and no matter how great it was, to be loss. I consider it to be dung, refuse, worthless. For the excellency of the knowledge of the true Christ, the one who could save my soul from sin. And here he doesn't just stop by saying I, uh, we need to give up that past life. He says, if there was anyone who could say that they were rejoicing in, under the law of Moses, it was me, Paul said. <laughs> Paul said, look what I gave up. He said, I might also have confidence in the flesh. If any other man thinketh that he have, uh, hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. So individuals, he says, uh, for you individuals who think that you can find confidence or joy in the law of Moses, you can't find what I had. 
And I gave it up and considered it done. And here's what he said. I was circumcised the eighth day, right? Just like every Jew. I was of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As touching the law of Pharisee, that is, I was of the strictest uh, adherents or adherers to the law. Uh, those that would bind laws uh, where they weren't even bound under the old law. Concerning zeal, you can't judge my zeal, Paul said, under the law of Moses. I, my zeal led me to persecute Christians, put them in jail for nothing other than uh, believing in Christ. And as we have studied in our Acts class, consenting to the death of Christians, right? So he was very zealous. You can't deny the zeal of Paul in his past life as touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. That is, as much as he possibly could fulfill the law of Moses, he did it. He did it. He practiced what he preached. But then he says, what things were gained to me, those things I counted for loss. He would have been in the highest of highs of that religious hierarchy, right? A Hebrew of Hebrews. As concerning the law of a Pharisee. He was religiously right in his mind. But not only that, he had political uh, connections because of his position, because of his uh, actions. But he said, what things were gained to me, those things I counted loss for Christ. And they were, weren't they? Everything he did after Jesus died on the cross for his religion was contrary to Christ and the church. It was destructive to the Christ and his church. It was, re it was him rejoicing in what he thought was right, but it was damaging to the cause of Christ. It was loss. And so then we see that his joy changed, right? It changed from being adhering to the law of the flesh, which he recognized was nailed to the cross, and now, giving all that up, simply to be a Christian. See, he didn't give all that up and then get the same equal value on the other side, did he? In the, in the world. You know, he was a Hebrew of the Hebrew. He didn't become a Christian of Christians. He gave up everything. He had political connections over here on this side. And over here, he didn't have any political connections. He was running for his life most of the time. They considered him a traitor. And they wanted to kill him on this side, right? In this life, he gave up everything. On the other side, what did he have? He had hope of eternal life. And he said, that's worth more than anything I could have ever gained as a Jew. That's worth more than anything I have I could have gained as a non-Christian. And in the first century, a non-Christian would have not had to have gone through persecution. Right? They wouldn't have been persecuted financially. They could have had uh, wealth. They wouldn't have been persecuted because they weren't teaching the Christ. He could have continued to be politically connected. Right? In this life. But he gave all that up. And he said it was worthless. It was as done because for me to rejoice in the Lord was to not put my faith and my trust in the physical life, but to look ahead to the spiritual. To look ahead to heaven. To look ahead to eternity. And that's where it begins here in verse 8. That rejoice in the Lord. Don't rejoice in your past. Don't rejoice in Judaism. Don't rejoice in all the things you could have in this life. Give that up. Count it as dung. Count it as loss. And then gain Christ. And that's what he then makes an appeal to. To all individuals in Philippi who would listen to him. And in particular, individuals of the Jewish persuasion or those who were being courted by Jews to leave Christianity, he makes this appeal. And, it, and this appeal here begins 
in verse 8. And the appeal is, be, follow me as I leave behind that past life and look ahead to eternity. I may not have what I had in the flesh, but what I have is much better. I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I might win Christ. That's how you rejoice in the Lord, right? To appeal, make an appeal to the victory that is in Christ. He wanted to find a daily victory, not in the things that he had gained in this life, but in the things that he learned and put into practice that would help him in the next life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, we remember that Paul said, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. In Romans chapter 8, verse 16 beginning. He says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit. The Spirit here a reference to the one who revealed the Word of God. Therefore, he's talking about the Word of God. The Word bears witness with our spirit. That's who we are, our person. That we are the children of God. Now, how does that take place? Well, we open up the mirror of God's Word and we look and we say, well, the Spirit says this is what one must do to be saved. This is what I did. Is it the same? And when we study with non-Christians, that's a good way to study. Ask them, what did you do to be saved? Write it down on a piece of paper. Then let's see what God says you have to do. And see if they're equal, if they're the same. If they're not the same, someone's wrong. And it's not God, is it? But if we're the same, if I write down what I did in order to be saved, and I go to the Scripture and I find what God said to be, uh, do to be saved, and they're both the same, then the Spirit bears witness with what I did that I'm a child of God. I can know I'm a child of God based upon the fact that what I did is revealed in the Word of God. And if we are children, he then says, verse 17, then we are heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Paul said, I would rather give up everything in this physical life for the victory that is in Christ. The things that we suffer in this life, I find joy in more than that which was in my past life because my past life was leading me to destruction eternally. And he said, what little... Or I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, which he gave up all those good things in his past life for sufferings in his new. But in those new sufferings, he rejoiced in the Lord. Why? Because he knew that he was a child of God. Because he knew that the victory to win Christ was more valuable than anything he could win in this life. That no praise of this life, no praise of the political leaders of the first century, no praise of the Jewish leaders of the first century, no praise of the comrades that he associated with who persecuted the church in the first century was worth losing his soul for. What sufferings he endured on this side of that dividing line, that which he gave up and that which he took on, where he began to rejoice in the Lord was worth it. That he might win Christ. That he might achieve victory. See, he considered everything before that loss. <laughs> and everything after a win. Now the world sees it just the opposite, don't they? I have to give up everything? That's a loss. <laughs> That's just loss. I can't do those things that I would enjoy doing. That's a loss. 
They don't see the victory. They don't see the end game. They don't see the finish line. Paul appealed to people and their judgment to look at the end, look at the finish line, and then make the judgment, and then rejoice in the Lord. Don't rejoice in the things that you rejoice in now. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in, the, in doing things God's way. Then he says, not only that I might win Christ, but to be found in Him. Verse 9. Now victory is in Christ. And if I'm going to be victorious, I must be found in Christ. The Bible tells us how to get into Christ. By following the gospel plan to save, which culminates in water baptism. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, Paul says, Ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So here the Bible tells us how we can be found in Christ. We must be baptized into Christ. And of course the Bible tells us that if we are baptized into Christ, we've been baptized into His body, which is His church. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23 and Ephesians 4, verse 4. If we are found in Christ, then He should be found in us. Right? Now, Christ is in us just like the Holy Spirit is in us. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit how? Through the revealed Word of God. When we live like Christ and Christ is found in us, it's because we learn what Christ is and we put that in practice. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. To let the Word of Christ dwell in us is to let Christ dwell in us. That's the only way Christ can dwell in us. He gives us His Word. We put it in our hearts. We practice it. We, we teach it. And we are Christ-like. We're doing the things of Christ. He said as much in John 15 verse 7 when He was talking about being the vine and individuals being the branches. He said, if you abide in Me, well, we know how to abide in Him by obeying the Gospel. And My words abide in you. That's let Me dwell in you, right? But how does He tell us He's going to dwell in us? Let My words abide in you. Ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. In other words, you'll have a relationship. A close relationship. To be found in Christ and to be found with Christ in us is to be a Christian today. To learn of Him and to obey it. Paul then continues. He wanted to win Christ. He wanted the Jesus to be His daily victory. He wanted to be found in Christ. Not of His own doing. Not of His own righteousness. Not of His own plan of righteousness. Not of a Jewish plan of righteousness. But... That which is through faith of Christ. Right? The gospel plan of salvation. For what purpose? Verse 10. That I might know Him. That I might know Him. <laughs> you know, the Jews knew about Jesus. And a lot of G Jews saw Him in the flesh. They spit on Him. Some of them did. They hated Him, right? So they knew Him. They knew of Him. Paul knew of Him. Paul had seen Him <laughs> after His death, burial, and resurrection. Jesus showed Himself to him, right? On the road to Damascus. So what does it mean when Paul said that I might know Him? It wasn't just to know about Him. It was to know the things that Christ would have him to do. 
to believe on the words of Jesus and to act appropriately. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus there with a representative of the old law and the patriarchal system. And Moses goes away and the prophet goes away and Jesus stands alone. And a voice from heaven, God the Father says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. In other words, look, I sent the law of Moses. It had a purpose. And there was a time when I told the people, hear him. And there was a time when I sent the prophets to the people. And I told the people, hear them. That's done away with now. This is my son. This is not just a man that I chose, Moses. And this is just not a man of God, a prophet. This is my beloved son, my only begotten son. Hear Him. To hear Him is to know Him. To hear what He teaches, to hear what He says, and to become like Him. That's what Paul wanted to do. Paul didn't want to just know of Jesus. He wanted to try to become more and more like Jesus. He told his readers and listeners, follow me, as I follow Christ. Paul wanted to imitate Jesus. He wanted to, be a, he wanted to be like Jesus. And then he, he encourages everyone else, be like Jesus. Don't just know about Him. Be like Him. And the only way to be like Him is to know everything. What did He say? How did He act? How did He respond? We can learn so much, right? The Master Teacher. <laughs> the great example. To be like Him in this life is important. Paul understood that. Why? Because in the next life, we want to be like Him. <laughs> in 1 John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, John says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. And of course, we've already talked about what that means to be a son of God. One who has heard the Gospel, believed it, and obeyed it. And he says, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. We didn't do it of our own merit. It was a, a, an act of love. It was an act of grace. But notice what he says then. That we are sons of God. That we're trying to be like Jesus. Then he says, therefore the world knows us not. Now do they, obviously people in the world know us. They see us walking around. We work with them. Uh, we talk with them. We might go to school with them. Whatever the case is, people know us. They see us, right? It's not like we're invisible. But what John was saying here was they don't know us. They don't try to get to know us as Christians. They're not interested in knowing what we teach or practice or why we teach it or why we practice it. And in some cases, they try to stay as far away from possible as getting to know us as possible, don't they? Many times when they find out we're members of the Church of Christ, they want to stay away as, as far as possible from getting to know who we are. The world doesn't want to know the ways of the Christian because they're so opposite. The world is condemned by the light. Those who obey the Christ, those who obey the Gospel, are a condemnation to those who do not. Now those in the world who want to be like Jesus will seek to be like us. They'll seek to be like Jesus and they'll seek to know Jesus and they'll seek to know us. But then know this. The world knoweth us not. Why? Because it knew Him not. See, it's the same way, isn't it? Why is it that they don't know us? The same reason they didn't know Him. 
They didn't like what he had to say. <laughs> they didn't like what he had to say. They didn't want to know him. Even when he came to this earth, the Jews to which G, uh, Paul was talking to, the concision, those who were trying to stir up trouble in the church or those who were trying to cause individuals to fall away or to keep people from converting in the first place, they wanted people to stay as far away from Jesus as possible. They lied about what Jesus was and what, what Jesus said and what Jesus did, didn't they? They brought up false accusation against him. They ridiculed him. They didn't want people to know the true Jesus, the true Christ. And when he came to this earth, they didn't recognize him as the king, did they? Had they recognized him as the king, they would have accepted him. They just saw him as a problem, primarily. They didn't see him as the king of the Jews or the king of the world or the savior of the world. They saw him as a problem. They know us not because they know him not. That means we are to be like him. <laughs> we're to say things like him. We're to act like him. We're to practice things like him. We're to be like him. And if the world doesn't know us, it's not because they don't want to know us. It's because they don't want to know Christ. So to know Christ is more than just to know about him. They know about him and they know about us. <clears throat> and then in verse 2 of John, 1 John 3, he says, In this life, we are to be like Christ. Verse 1, right? The world knows us not because they knew Him not in this life. Then verse 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be in the next life. But we know this, when He shall appear, the second time, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. If we're like him in this life, to the best of our ability, we'll be like him in the next, because we're the sons of God. We're heirs, joint heirs with the Christ. And of course, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 kind of explains a little about what we might look like but we won't be a fleshly, physical being. Just as Jesus is not a fleshly, physical being. Paul then continues <clears throat> that I may know Him, verse 10, and the power of His resurrection. If by any means, verse 11, I might attain unto the resurrection from the dead. Basically saying what John said, to be like Jesus now, so that I can be like Him in eternity and be with Him in eternity. I want to be resurrected to live with Christ in eternity. And for that reason, he says this, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, no matter how good they were, no, how much, no matter how much joy it gave me, right? no matter how high I was in society, no matter how much political uh, connections I had, no matter how where I was in my, uh, my Jewish faith, I put all that behind. I forget all those things in my past life. And I reach forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The dividing line, right? I, put, I forget those things behind and I rejoice from now on in the Lord. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, at the end of Paul's life, he said, I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. This was what Paul was looking forward to, wasn't it? This is what he was rejoicing in. I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. I'm going to do things His way so that in eternity I can be with Him forever. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. He won the battle, didn't He? He won the victory. He counted all things but loss. 
but he won the victory. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Now that's what Paul was doing in Philippians. He was saying, I am looking forward to that day. And I want you to look forward to that day too. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. <laughs> Count all things prior to my conversion as loss. That I might win Christ. That I might know Christ. That I might be found in Christ. That I might be resurrected with the Christ. That I might press towards that great goal of heaven. This morning, if you're not a Christian, the plan of salvation is simple. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. The Word of God tells us we must repent of our past sins, confess that Jesus is the Christ, be immersed in water to have those past sins washed away. Forget those things in the past and press toward the mark of the high calling of God, living as Jesus would have us faithful unto death, Revelation 2 verse 10, so that we might, like Paul, be able to say, I have fought a good fight, I have kept the faith, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. If you have already obeyed the gospel but have some other need, there's something uh, keeping you uh, from heaven, if we can assist you in any way, it is our desire to help as we stand and sing.